Your love makes me sing. Hallelujah. 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 Your love makes me sing. Your love is surprising. I can feel it rising. All the joy that's growing deep inside of me. Every time I see you, all your goodness shines through, and I can feel this God song rising up in me. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Your love makes me sing. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Your love makes me sing. is amazing, steady and unchanging. Your love is a mountain firm beneath my feet. Your love is a mystery, how you gently lift me. When I am surrounded, your love carries me. Hallelujah.
justice and praise become my embrace to love you from the inside out everlasting your light will shine when all else fades never ending your glory goes beyond all faith and the cry of my heart is to bring you praise from the inside out of oh, my soul cries out my heart and my soul I give you control consume me from the inside out Lord let justice and praise become my embrace to love you from the inside shall call with trumpet sound oh may I then in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone faultless to stand before the throne on Christ the song Father God, we thank you so much that, that you are the rock of our salvation, Lord, that you made your sacrifice to, to save us, Lord, that your love is overwhelming, that your grace is, is more than enough for us to, to be with you, to be in fellowship with you. And Father, we just lift up this time once again. The, the study of your word, Lord, is, is such a blessing. It is so amazing and, and so wonderful, Lord. So we just thank you for that. We lift it up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. 
Welcome to Calvary Chapel. We're going to go through a few announcements this morning. This afternoon after the service at 1.30 is our senior worship and Bible study at the assisted living facility. So if you would like to join in on that, uh, please see Pastor Robert and he'll give you directions. Coming next month is our VBS and we need volunteers. So if you would like to take a short trip to Kilimanjaro, now is the time to do it. So we need teachers, helpers, builders, cooks, and entertainers. And uh, for more information, please see Stephanie, Liz, or Robert. Again, just a reminder, guys, our Tuesday night uh, discipleship has been moved to the second Saturday of the month. So the next one will be the second Saturday in June. And then Friday night here at the church is uh, U-Turn for Christ Bible study. So please come and enjoy. Uh, offering boxes are over on this wall and that wall. As you remember, it used to be on the back wall, but we have moved it. So um, donate as the Lord puts on your heart. And just uh, you know, give what, what God has, has planted in your heart. And finally, Saturday. Uh, as most of you know, I, I have had the privilege of watching one son graduate. I'm about to watch a daughter graduate on Saturday from high school. And so as yeah, 4 o'clock, it's, 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 seating is open, so if you get there early, you can get a seat. If you show up at 4.15, you may be standing at the Coliseum. If everybody knows what the Coliseum is, great. But to follow up with that, here at the church, 7 o'clock Saturday evening, we're having a celebration for both graduations and the 28th anniversary of my wife and myself. So uh, come, come, and, and it is a potluck, so please, you know, just kind of bring something that you feel would be appropriate and just have some fun. So thank you, Pastor Robert. Take it away. Appropriate for one guy can be so much different than another. So, I didn't say that. I just, no, I'm kidding. Um, now, here we go. Uh, you know, just a reminder of that and note of that. Um, as we get into this, one of the things I just, you know, you know Lord, I uh, think it impressing upon me is just, um, you know, if something's going on, especially as we get into the message today, uh, and, you know, we have people that join us online, and uh, we've got people that um, are doing that. And, uh, it, you know, if the Lord puts anything on your heart, that at the end of service, you know, after we have closed things that you, you really feel like must be shared, approach me. Because this isn't just a place for me to teach and share um, right now, I'm acting in the gift that God has given, but we're supposed to pour into one another. And that's one of the things that, you know, we've got to have that time for and make that time for. So, um, and, and, uh, and I just want to, at the end of service today, pray for those that need healing and um, just lift everyone up in that. So if you would, join me not right now in prayer for the service. Father, we come to you and we thank you so much, uh, Lord, for your word, which, <laughs> man. Yeah, the more and more we read it, the more and more we are, are, are taken to a place, Father, where we realize that the, that which is truly spiritual and powerful is real and has come into our universe to have fellowship with us. As we look at this, Lord, help us to, to know and understand as imperfect as we are, you still want to use us. Help us, Lord, not to get stuck on our failures or our failings or our weaknesses, Lord, as they can become so dominant in our lives. We pray as we look at this message today that we would know and understand there is no one perfect, no, not one, except for Him who saved us and gave everything for us. And we lift everything up to You and we praise You for the day. Bless, Lord, this Your Word in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. You can turn to Acts chapter 6, um, and, and even as you're turning, uh, something that just really impressed upon me as I was going through this is right now there's at least, at least, I mean there's probably more, you know, it's kind of like the whole idea, and again, I'm not trying to be demeaning or noting, but 
You know, it's like the idea of cockroaches where you see one, there's 50, right? Um, but there's at least three people who want to tell me that um, what I'm doing and how I'm doing church is wrong. Excuse me a moment. I just spotted a cup that I don't remember putting there, but I know I will spill it on myself by the end of service. So I just had to move it. Um, and, and, you know, the funny thing is, is some approach me and actually criticize and say, well, you guys aren't, you know, speaking in tongues in church. You weren't uh, doing active healings. Um, you're not taking an offering. You're not um, having people come forward to be slain in the spirit. And then I have others that say we talk too much about the Holy Spirit. We talk too much about these things. And I have others that say that we should join the Catholic Church because that's the oldest church, isn't it? Um, you know, again, I, I get these proddings, questions, attacks, whatever you'd want to call them all the time. Um, and as we get into Acts chapter 6 here, the hilarious thing to me is I see how we really are like the early church. Because they were messed up, right? Um, and, and the funny thing is, is, is even when they get it wrong, and these are the apostles, not the apostles, right? And even as they get it wrong, it makes it where I can go, you know what, I can get it wrong and be okay. So let's check it out now. Because here we see these guys, man, that have literally witnessed in the, in the flesh, as you would want to say, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then they blow it. Uh, I'm going to go through Acts chapter 6, and um, it's going to be verses 1 through 7, and I'm calling it simply serve. Um, our first point is going to be mur, 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 and you'll get that in a second. Um, in Acts chapter 6, let's look at verses 1 and 2 real quick. Now, in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists, because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. The twelve, Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, it is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Now, these days, one of the things that, you know, you look at this and it says, though in those days, and that's a general reference to a passage of time. It's like, you know, like when you're watching a movie and there's a white transition and then everybody comes up and they all look older and different. And, you know, and that's what's happening here. Um, Luke, as he's writing to us, he gives us a transition and he says, okay, then there were, you know, in those days, it's like in those times, back in those days. And most people think with the timing that we're going to see later on, this is maybe five years or so after Christ has, you know, been, been raised up into heaven. So, you know, and after the Holy Spirit and the church was born. So this is, they're going about five years into this now. Um, and, and, of course, what happens when you have something, a, a living organism, which the church really is because he calls it the body of Christ, and what does your body do as it grows? You know, you get aches, you get pains, things hurt, things don't work, and, you know, that's the body of Christ. We're a living organism, and that's one of the things that you and I need to understand as we get into this is when things seem to not go wrong, it doesn't mean that we're not right. You know, the idea of, of being the body of Christ is not that we're right. It's that we're following after him. And here, these guys are doing it. And you got to think, man, you know, because we're like, oh, could, why can't we be like them? Why can't we do that? You know, healings, things going off left and right. Boom, there's a miracle dropping over there. They see this, and yet a complaint arose, which simply means if you get a group of people into a place, somebody's not going to like what's going on. It's our nature, right? And the complaint that arose, the, the Greek, if you were to read it, you know, in the, way, in the way that it's intended here, it's a low undertone murmuring. You know, it's, it's an onomatopoeic word. It's the same thing that, that we say when we use the word murmur. It's somebody saying something under their breath. Or whispering, so you know, it's like when you take somebody aside to complain about the pastor, and you go, because you, know, you don't want other people to hear you. It's murmur, 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 murmur. That's what it is, right? Uh, uh, the 
Greek is gogizmos, which to them was that same thing. You know, like a gaggle of hens, as it were. And the word means a secret debate, a secret displeasure, not openly avowed. And you and I, as we look into this, we want to understand that, you know, it's what we tend to do when we're talking to someone about someone else, especially about someone else that's in authority. When the Bible says if we have a complaint against someone, take it to them, take it to your brother. But eventually it does get back to them. And, you know, here's what they get. They get the complaint that the Hellenists are complaining about the Hebrews, right? And you read that and you start to think, okay, it's the Greeks complaining against the Hebrews, but it's not. The Hellenists were actually Jews. We've got to remember, even in this five years following the resurrection, it's still predominantly and primarily a Jewish sect, okay? They're not even calling themselves Christians at this time. Uh, many of them are called followers of the way or simply the disciples of Jesus, things like that, right? Um, but they're primarily Jewish. But what it is, and Gentiles are going to believe, and we're actually going to see where a lot of the Gentile proselytes that have been brought into the church, and when I say proselyte, that means they were Gentiles who became Jews, all right? Um, and, and now they're becoming believers in Jesus Christ. Uh, and though, and I'm sure there are Gentiles in this group, but it's predominantly Jewish. Um, the debate, though, is that because Hellenists were primarily Greek-speaking Jews that were in Jerusalem, um, and, and it's like a natural barrier between the two because the Hellenists were kind of like they were very modern and hip for the day. They were the hipsters of their day, right? They wore the tight robes. No, I'm kidding. Um, but, you know, they, they would dress more like Greeks and Romans. But yet they were Jews. They were born Jews. Uh, many of them were thought to be of the diaspora, which were the Jews that had gone out, had been driven out, and now they've, they're coming back or they've come back for the festivals. But most of them are there to be discipled, to learn about Jesus so they can take it back. But here... You know, all these guys that are that the Hebrews, as they call them, these are the ones that are old school. Right. You know, the the robe has to be down so far. You got it. No, I'm kidding. But, you know, it, they dress more like the Jews and the Arabs of Israel. OK, so that's really what's happening here. And it's two groups. And what are they complaining about? They're complaining about their widows being neglected. Now, what's a widow? Okay, we're going to define that in a moment. But as you look into it, the widows of this time, you and I have to understand we live in a country that, you know, has a lot of programs and things to take care of its people. Most other nations don't have that or have never had that. Um, for instance, my wife, when she was uh, doing missions in Mexico, in the town of Merida where they were, many of the senior citizens that were past a certain age, most of them lived in the street. There was actually a ministry there that specifically, it was almost like, you know, and, and again, I don't mean to demean anybody, but it made me think of people that go out looking for stray dogs and taking them in. There was a family there that had gone out and they would look for these old people that were lying in the streets and some of them literally dying. And they would pick them up and take them back to this house. And they had basically set up all these um, hammocks and and, chair, and lawn chairs and everything they could get. And they had, what, how many was it? 25 senior citizens at that place? And had one small refrigerator, and they made meals for them, at least one meal a day. And that's all they had. And you got to think that, you know, death is so very common. At this time here in Israel, you could get an infection, and you're gone. Right. We get the pneumonia and we go to the doctor, you know, we get a scratch, you know, we put some neo nah, 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 sporin, right? We put some neo sporin on it. Right. And, and we're all good to go. They didn't have that. So you as a as a, you know, they said the widows, because most of the widows, once they got past a certain age, they really couldn't take care of themselves. And with no son, with no family, with no anything they would be left out to the streets. You know, and it's sad. 
um, the Bible tells us in Exodus 22, 22, Deuteronomy 10, 18, 14, 29, and Psalm 146, 9, it tells us kind of the same thing that James tells us in James 1, 27, which is pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Which is pretty cool to me because James is saying, you know, you want to be right before God. Don't get mixed up with the world and then ministers to the, minister to the orphans and to the widows. Because they have no one to care for them. And visit doesn't just mean hang out. It means minister to feed, clothe. The primary things that all of us tend to need. And here the church is ministering to the widows. But how many do they have? Right? How many people does it take to get into an argument? Two. <laughs> That's it. Some of you got multiple personalities. You argue with yourself all the time, right? And that's okay. But, you know, they could have had literally two widows. There could have been one Hellenistic widow and one Hebrew widow, and then both groups would have said, she's getting more than mine is. That's all it took, right? We don't know how many there is, but... You know, one of the things that you and I need to understand, because what is what what qualifies as a widow? Um, I was going to say, if you wanted to turn to first Timothy five, three through ten, but with the content and everything we have, I'm not sure if we have time. Here's the thing. If you were to turn to first Timothy five, three through ten, Paul begins to talk about widows and he says, honor widows who are really widows. I'm going to just go ahead and read it. He qualifies. He's like, okay, honor widows who are really widows. And most of us would go, what do you mean? Because isn't a widow a widow? And Paul's like, nah, it's not. Right? But if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety at home and to repay their parents. That's why we had four kids. We're hoping at least one of them is going to take care of us, right? That's our retirement plan. <laughs> Well, yeah, okay. <laughs> but here's the thing. It says, you know, that repay their parents. They're indebted. You know, our children are indebted to us. We're indebted to our parents. You know, it's one of the reasons I keep trying to get my mom, mom come move down here, come move down here. But she just doesn't want to leave where she's at. Um, you know, and, and, and I understand that. Uh, but God's not calling me there. And if she gets to a point where she simply can't do it anymore and my brothers aren't taking care of her, you know, we'll do whatever we can and not give her a choice. We're going to get her here. But here it says, you know, because that's our responsibility as, as children. That's my responsibility. It says, let them first show piety at home and to repay their parents for this is good and acceptable before God. You know, like, you know, and God tells us over and over again, honor your mother and your father. Do these things, right? Uh, Paul reinforces it throughout Timothy and in other places. Verse 5 of 1 Timothy 5 says, but she who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. You know, because there were women who would become widows, but they would become widows of good households or something like that. And they would simply live and do whatever they wanted. You know, not caring about anybody else and then expect to be taken care of in this. And it was like, that's not the case here, Paul says. He says, in these things command, verse 7. He's like, you tell the widows this, that they may be blameless. He said, you know, so you tell the widows, you say, this is what you need to do to be a widow, Right. If anyone does not provide, and for the families to take care of their people, because in verse 8 he says, if anyone does not provide for his own, especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Wow. You don't take care of your peeps? You know, hit the streets. That's right, man. Um, you know, and in Corinthians he reinforces when people are living in this manner, don't even have dinner with them, Right? It's like, you guys chill. Um, and he goes on and he says, listen, you know, do not let a widow, verse 9, under 60 years old be taken into the number. And not unless, so 60, above 60, that's the widow limit, right? 
um, and not unless she has been the wife of one man, well reported for good works, if she has brought up children, if she has lodged strangers, she takes care of people, she ministers to people, if she has washed the feet of the saints. Does that mean she's literally washing feet? No. That's them referring back to what Jesus did, which means they serve brothers and sisters in Christ. Others are more important than their own self. And it says, if she has relieved the afflicted, if she has diligently followed every good work. So a widow to be taken care of by the church, that's the qualification. And the thing is, is I know many of you, and I know many of you would fit this. Not the 60 thing. I'm not calling anybody. It's not 60 yet. 60, okay? But I know many of you. You care for others. You do serve the body of Christ. You do do these things. Okay, and so the point that Paul is making here is that, you know, these are moral, upstanding women that serve the body of Christ, and they are the body of Christ. They are family, and family takes care of its own, okay? Daily, they were being fed, they were ministering to, so they were feeding and clothing these widows, right? And they had the money to do it because people were coming and selling whole pieces of property and homes and everything else and giving it to the church. The problem was that how the issue got started, we don't know. The, it, doesn't, it doesn't even say it really was happening. It's simply a complaint that got lodged. And it actually, and it becomes a thing because you got two groups of people like we tend to do, right? If somebody comes in and they're from Oakland, and somebody else comes in from Oakland and they hang out here at the church and they find out or they're from Philly or from wherever you're from, you, find, you, you tend to congregate a, a, with people that are common to you, that know you. They may know your language, how you talk. Um, they may know some of the same, collo- you know, when I say language, I mean like colloquialisms. You know, like here, you know, if somebody says pop and you go, what's a pop, right? But somebody that knows what pop is goes, Hey, they talk like me, and we tend to congregate. And that's what's happening here. It's two groups that tend to, tend to naturally separate into groups, and now they've got a schism in between as it's driving them apart. And it has to do with widows, which is a very religious subject, even to the Jews, right? Money, right? And authority. Why? Because the apostles aren't getting the job done. That's what they're saying here. They're not, they're not really accusing those guys. They're saying the apostles aren't getting the job done. The apostles are preaching the word of God. They're teaching about Jesus Christ. They're literally healing people in the streets. But, you know, hey, if you can't do everything, I don't really don't think you guys are really doing church right. You know, that's really what they're saying here. Here, they have guys that are literally being beaten and consider it a privilege to be beaten for the word that they are preaching. And the very body that they're ministering to is saying, you blew it. So what do they do? Do they attack them? Do they come back at them? They don't. They don't do that. You know, they don't say, you know, they say, listen, they don't say, they're like, you're right. We blew it. But here's how they put it. It's not right that we should stop preaching. God did not call us, you know, to administrate this. We see an issue in what they're calling. They're saying we're not administrators. We're going to see later on as the gifts are given in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8, 1 Peter 4, 11, we see many of the gifts of the Holy Spirit mentioned there. A couple of times it mentions administrations or administrator. Literally, it's a calling from God to help administer the church. That's not their calling, they're saying. We're not, we're not called to do that. I'm not called to be an administrator. I'm called to be, they're saying, an apostle of Jesus Christ. I've seen Jesus alive and risen from the dead. You know, we're not called to hang out with everybody and to do those things. We're called to go and preach the gospel as it is given. 
They're not saying those things aren't good either. They're not demeaning those services. They're not even saying that what we do is better. They're saying we're not moving in our gifting. It's not right that we should stop doing the whole thing that God told us to do. Jesus didn't go and say, you know, make sure you start these programs, make sure you do these things, make sure. He said, go, share the gospel to the ends of the earth, right? And the fact is, you know, as they're not moving in their gifting doing this, it's breaking down. That's not their gifting to administrate these things. You know, their gifting is in the teaching and preaching of their doctrine. You know, and, and the gifts that they show here, administration, apostle, you know, pastor, teacher, evangelist, one, no one is better than the other. They are all complementary. They all complement each other. When you have someone that has the gift of administrations, it doesn't mean they were a great administrator or worked for Wall Street. Sometimes you really don't want somebody that worked for Wall Street to come in and do administration, right? It's like, okay, you blew that up. Now you're going to come blow this up. No thanks, okay? The fact is, is they are called to help do those things, and God enables them by the Holy Spirit to do them. And it's in that that it is complementary because the apostles... Mighty, mighty apostles, right? Superman of the, of the faith blew it. They couldn't do it. So they needed to depend on others because they could not handle it. To, you know, you and I have different callings. Some of us may have the same calling. Some of us may be gifted for, to do certain things. But the evidence that we are called at all is that we are willing to bless the body of Christ. Sometimes being unsure of our calling, we can go, I'm not sure what he's calling me to do. Do something. Right? One of the reasons that we're going to see the names of these guys in the scriptures that we're looking at today is because they stepped up. All right? Not just stepped up, but they were a part of something. And again, this doesn't mean as a pastor, I shouldn't take out the garbage because that's not my calling, right? That's just me being lazy. Okay? So... It's, that's not what I'm saying here. But I am saying that each of us needs to operate primarily in that gifting into what we were called to do so that we are effective to the body of Christ. Not everybody can be a leg. Not everybody can be a hand. Not everybody can be an ear. Paul even talks about and says, you know, what is the, you know, is the eye going to say, hey, I'm going to do what I want to do today? No. It's a part of the body. So you and I need to understand that, that our qualifications aren't even in knowing a lot. Someone may come in who was an administrator for a business, and God wants him to teach children's church or her to teach children's church. You know, somebody may come in and be a beautiful singer, but God wants them to handle the garbage. Right? He doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. And there are times where he calls us to come in and simply be a servant, to be faithful in it, to be one of those that's available in there. Because what do they call when they say to serve tables there, when you see in your script, it says to serve tables or to minister to tables or to do these things. The word serve there is diakonos. It's where we get our word deacon from. And it just means a servant. That's really what it is. So when you know of deacons in the church, especially in the modern church, most deacons are people who think that they're supposed to run the church, that they're in charge. And in many churches, even here in this town, that's true. It's the deacons running the show. It's the deacon show, right? Because it's become a position of influence and power instead of service. It's become one where, you know, they literally run things and will sometimes even say it. And it's a shame because notice, you know, we're going to see what's going to happen here. But the tables they're talking about serving too. The tables, it's not like they're just, you know, putting food down at the tables. The tables that it talks about is the same tables that it talks about with the money changers. They're handling money. They're going to decide where this money's going to be spent. They're going to be the ones making sure things get done. And, you know, so it's like they're telling the church, 
when they say this in verse 3, we're going to see voluntold in, in verse 3. So look at me with me at verse 3. Because God has something else in mind for some of these men who prove faithful, who, who the people call up here. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, who we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Note that he says there, seek out from among you seven men. So let's look at the qualifications of those being set out. Okay, um, of good reputation, it says these men are, you know, and, and notice. He says to the whole congregation, were there more Hellenists than Hebrews? I doubt it. But all of the men that are picked by the people are all Hellenists. Which means that probably many of the Hebrews even said these guys are right on. Now, isn't that something that's very cool to me? Because to have a, a reputation like that, it shows volumes about the characters of these men. Because even the people that don't necessarily, because even these Hebrews, who are very traditional in their ways, say, yes, Stephen, that, that dude's right on. I would totes allow him to be in charge of stuff, right? That's the character that this guy has. That reputation, that word reputation there, is the same word that we use for martyr, witness. These are guys that have died to themselves, and it shows. It's evident to everybody. And the reason that it shows is because they're in fellowship with people. They're interacting with them. They are a part of them. And that's something that, you know, you and I have to, again, we're suppo- we need to be coming after myself am i after myself do i have this reputation among the body you know do my brothers and sisters in christ around me know me well enough to call me faithful do i have a good reputation with them i know i have a reputation of being forgetful all right it's the gray man i just blame the gray it's 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 gray because it's sucking the memories out of my head right or white i don't know gray white whatever it is Okay. But the thing is, 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 is they are such men of the body that they are found trustworthy by those in the church. Do people trust me that way? That's the do I they, do I have that reputation? Do you have that reputation? Full of the Holy Spirit. The, when it says full there, it's the word for being filled. It's a consistent, constant, present thing. It's not, you know, got the Holy Ghost, I'm good. It's I'm being filled with it. I'm, I'm always looking, you know, what, what are you going to do with me today, God? Give me the strength to do it. Right? It, it means to be completely filled to overflowing. And these men have displayed an intimacy with the Holy Spirit that is evident to everyone. Is that true with me? Is that true with you? Do people have a relationship with you where they go, this guy's different, this gal's different. There's something different here, right? Especially if they knew the old you. If they knew the old you that said, he would have gotten his truck by now and run somebody down, right? And then they know the new you, and you ain't perfect, but they know you's different, right? And that's the thing. Do they know that we are controlled now? Not completely. We're not robots. But do they understand and know now that we are controlled by the Holy Spirit? You know? And and is it evident to those around us? That's that's the thing that we have to question in this. Because these guys, it is to these people. Full of wisdom, it says. Even though they're looking for somebody that's called, they're looking for somebody to do things, they still don't pick, like, kids, you know, Or people that can't count because they got to handle money, right? So people full of wisdom, they need to understand how to do these things. They need to understand people and deal with people. Um, You know, so they choose these men this way. And notice, too, what they're saying here. They don't give this authority away, right? Because they say, you guys pick them, we'll appoint them. So they're not, it's not congregational vote decides how everything's going to happen because the apostles are, you know, if they don't like the guys that are brought up or the Holy Spirit says no, they're going to say N-O, right? Those guys are gone. We're going to use these. 
You know, so they're they're not just giving this authority away. And understand, you know, the apostles acting as they are right now, it's not a power thing. It's a responsibility and an accountability thing. It's a grace thing. Because they're operating in this way, they're willing to take the hit. They're willing to take the blame. There are times where I have recommended people for, you know, for service, for ministry, um, to become pastors, and they have totally gone off the rails. And I just have to take the hit for that. Because all these people could have voted these guys in. The apostles could have said, all right, you chose them. It's on you now, right? And if it goes south, hey, y'all voted for them. But now they're saying, in their authority as God has given them, we're going to lay hands on them to show his approval. They're going to show, because it says they pray, right? We're going to see. So this is a grace thing. These are outstanding men of God, you know, and, and their brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ testify to this. It's not a vote thing. It's a, I trust him more than anybody. And that's one of the things that you and I, as we witnesses and we see these things, are we such faithful men and women of God that people would say the same thing about us? The third point of today, growing in grace. Let's look at verses 5 through 7. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. This is, you know, people are saying this is exactly what we want. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Procurus, or Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. That tells you there he's a Greek proselyte, okay? Whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Wow. You can stop there. We're going to look at this in a little more detail next week in some of these guys, who they were, where where we think some of them may have ended up in history. But notice that these men, remember, they're being chosen to serve tables. Um, And men... They don't elevate themselves. They're, they're not going out and going, hey, you know, vote for me for deacon of the table. They're not doing that. They're not going up to the apostles going, hey, 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 I'm right here, man. Put me in. Put me in, coach, right? It's not that thing. It's these are guys who are simply faithful and they're honest and they're upstanding men of the church and the church elevates them, you know. It, it's the idea of being humble enough to be elevated by God. Right. Um, And all the names are Hellenistic. We talked about that. They're all Greek names here. Um, Stephen, as you see right there, we're going to verse eight describes him as full of faith and power. And and, and as we get into this. This is one of the things that you and I need to understand that he was filled initially in his service to God. To make sure widows got fed. Something. So if you and I can be faithful in the smallest of things, what will God use us for when the time comes? Philip, in Acts chapter 8, we're going to see he will preach to the Ethiopian eunuch that would never be accepted in the temple, right? Because eunuchs, they couldn't go in because they were, they were cut. They were castrated. But yet, God made a point of bringing Philip to him that he might be saved take the gospel into Ethiopia. The rest were all men willing to serve and knowing the scrutiny that is going to come on them when they do this. The apostles are going to be looking at them. Everybody's going to be looking at them. You know, it's that fishbowl thing. Hey! Power, responsibility, authority, and accountability in the church is not what it is in the world. It's not becoming the manager and the boss. It's becoming the main guy in the fishbowl that now everybody's looking at. And everybody's going to judge. So these guys willing to serve in this manner are willing to be put under scrutiny for people to examine their life even further. Because that's what happens when we get into it. 
That's why we need, you need to just be walking in Him, being faithful to Him, you know. And again, most of us would call it judgment, but it, it's simply a, a fruit investigation. It's really not judging for whether we're saved or not. It's whether we're walking in it. And they prayed. They prayed, it says. They didn't just do this. They didn't go, okay, guys, vote, 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 good to go. We vote for them too. Let's lay hands on them and be done. They prayed, it says. They prayed, they sought the Lord's guiding. The Holy Spirit didn't give them an ex nay, you know, on the Eakin day. It's like, they're good, take them. And then they preached, and the word of God spread. So the devil uses these, these infightings, these things to try and break up the church, to cause division, to get this group being against that group. The Holy Spirit used it to bind them even closer together and to relieve the pressure off the apostles because now they didn't have to do it and they could just do what they had been called to do. And it says the church grew. Why? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Verse 17 of John 3 says... God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world that the world through him might be saved. And that's the message that they preach. God does not come to condemn you. He comes to save you. And now they are able to do this effectively. God has sent his son to pay for all wrongdoing so that he can reestablish that relationship with humanity that was lost. And if you believe in him, you'll never truly die. It's beautiful and it's amazing. And if we believe in this, then right now his life comes to live in us. We are given his Holy Spirit and we will live forever. And he'll never leave or forsake us. And nothing can take us out of his hand, no matter how much we blow it. If the apostles blew it, then we, the apostles, are going to blow it. Probably a whole lot worse than they did. At least I am. You know, I don't know about you guys. Most of y'all are pretty good. Except for maybe some of you. I'm not going to point you out here in front of everybody. Andrew. And Michael's not here, so I really can't put him on the carpet. Right? Unless he's watching online, which I doubt it. He's probably sleeping. It's 11 o'clock. Right? But the thing is, is the deep truth in this, because you see these priests are coming to Jesus, right? It says, man, the priests are coming by the bucket load. You know, they, I, I think one of the things that I read was, there was around 8,000 priests in Jerusalem. 8,000. Most of these guys, when they did serve in the temple, it would be like once a year or once every two years. Right? And the rest of the time they had to scrape and, and, and do everything they could to try and survive because they were literally not permitted by the law to own property, to do certain things. Many times they would rent property from other people so they could grow stuff to help pay for their rental and to live. It was nuts. But these guys, this to them, they, you know, these guys are priests. Their whole life is spent learning the word and the law, and they see Christ as the fulfillment of Scripture, which many in Israel are doing today. As a matter of fact, we're gonna, I'm going to show you a, 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 a testimony uh, 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 of, of, a, of a Jewish man today. If you would, get that first in the videos folder. Get that first testimony ready. We're not going to play it yet. Just get it ready. It's a guy with a big long beard. Kind of looks like Rather. Yeah. But here's the thing. You know, when, when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, it, it really breaks down... You know, I've hung out with scientists and doctors, which never would have hung out with them before were it not for Jesus Christ bringing us in between. Because they knew they came to a faith in Jesus Christ. And the resurrection does that, man. It breaks down the barriers that we tend to put up. It tells, it tells the thugs, you're just as good as the doctors. It tells the lawyers, stop being, no, I'm kidding. It tells every one of us, no matter who we are, that we are all equal under Jesus Christ. There's no longer slave nor free, Jew nor Greek. You know, uh, you are all one in him. And that's what the resurrection does. And to, to say we believe is not just saying you believe. 
is to submit to him, to call him Lord, to trust him to do what he said to accomplish this salvation in their life. And the sign, it says that the priests were believers. Obedience. Obedience to the faith. You know, we, we tend to skim over those words sometimes, you know, because brothers and sisters, and I can say that in earnestly and honestly, we are called to walk in him, to live for him. We're not under any law or anything like that. You know. But we're called to walk in him. He is our standard. He is what we're shooting for. And you and I need to understand that because time is truly coming to an end. We've talked about this. I mean, time is literally going to cease to exist at some point in time. (laughs) Because he's going to come back on the stage. And when the author in his full form enters the stage, the play is over. You and I need to understand this world is winding down. And the apostles who truly believed that at any moment Jesus Christ was going to come back. So therefore, as they're doing this, they're like, he's coming back, guys. you got to do what you're called to do because he's going to come back at any moment. You're going to die at any moment. These guys are already being beaten for their faith. They know what's coming. Their very Lord was killed for the faith. Their testimony is unique among the believers, even at this time, right? And there would never be another apostle as them, never. In the same vein, your testimony, your testimony of Jesus Christ and what he has done in your life is unique to you. And you can share that into the lives of others and change their life because they see what God has done in you and then they see that they can change too. And each and every one of us needs to understand that we have a gift. As you have the Holy Spirit, you have a gift, and you need to find out what that is. The only way to accomplish that is to begin to do something. Dr. Werner von Braun, well known for his his part in the U.S. space program, talks about faith. He says, faith is very scientific. His reasons for believing in life after death, he explains, science has found that nothing can disappear without a trace. Nature does not know extinction. All it knows is transformation. If God applies the fundamental principle to the most minute and insignificant parts of the universe, doesn't it make sense to assume that it applies to the masterpiece of his creation, the human soul? I think it does. And as each and every one of you knows and understands that you are magnificent and unique in the eyes of God, so much so that he gave his son to save you. Everyone we meet out there, no matter what their station in life, no matter who they are, rich, poor, young, old, it doesn't matter, is made in the image of God. And you and I want to be everything that we can so that they can see him, that we can be a light that reflects him. We have something that is totally unique to every other religion in the world. We have a man that came in history. Historical fact, Jesus existed. Historical fact, Jesus died on the cross. And historical fact, no matter how many people want to dismiss it, is that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Three days in the grave, back up and kicking, guys. And that same Man, who you and I know to be the word made flesh that dwelt among us from John chapter one, said he's coming back. Do you believe it? Now, let's pray. Father, as we come to you right now, Lord, I just thank you so much for each and every person here. And we do pray, Lord, that we would hold on to you, that we would grab on to you, that we would be filled with this faith, Lord, that we would be obedient to the things you've called us to do. Uh, Father, even in the imperfection, in the way that we walk in you and in the, in the failures that we experience, we also know, Lord, that, uh, Father, there is grace, there is mercy. Um, Lord, help us to be men and women that would be willing to repent, to confess before one another, to come to one another, Lord, in seeking to be men and women of Jesus Christ, those walking in him. 
And I pray, Lord, as each and every person here, Father, if there's anyone here, Lord, that, uh, Father, that needs prayer for healing, that needs any of these things, that, um, Lord, that they would be willing to, to call for that, to lift that up, Lord, to, um, to, to not hold that back. Um, we lift up uh, Tony and David and, and George and Roz and, and, and Father, um, uh, those in the fellowship whom, whom we may not know of yet that have sought prayer. Uh, Lord, for, for Roz, just um, struggling with some of the medications and the things that are going on. Uh, Father, who ha- has been beat upon by this world and and um, by the things that are happening, and we just lift her up to you, Lord, that you would restore the joy of her salvation to her. Father, her faith is not shaken, um, but it, it is a battle. And uh, Lord, we lift up George to you. Uh, Father, a, a man truly who says he is ready to come home, uh, but we want him here, Lord. We are selfish, and uh, we want him around. And, uh, Father, we just lift him up to you and pray that if you're going to use medicine, that you would help him to find that that right doctor that would do that for him, that would help him to find the medications that would relieve the symptoms that he's experiencing. Uh, Lord, but we pray above all that you would just heal him. Lord, heal him in Jesus' name. Uh, For David, uh, for uh, what he is experiencing with uh, breathing and um, the other illnesses and things that happen, I, I just lift them up to you, Lord. I pray that uh, you would give him the, the the lungs of a young man, if, if that is what you choose, Lord. But, Father, we also just lift him up to you, and we thank you that he is a faithful man of God, that he uh, even does Bible studies at home for other members of his family uh, out there in, in, in Grape Creek. And I just I pray that you would continue to bless him for his faithfulness in that. And for Tony, Lord, just for what she's experiencing and um, all the things that are that are hitting upon her. And uh, we just thank you that she is uh, so faithful to pray and, and just uh, to minister to her family, her husband. And uh, just thank you so much for them. Uh, Lord, and for anyone else who's experiencing illness and, no, and those things, just lift them up to you. And then, uh, Father, pray that they would be you know, just willing to ask for prayer. Uh, Lord, for myself, uh, Father, just struggling with the flesh sometimes and uh, struggling with my doubts and my anxieties. I just uh, I pray, Lord, that you would have people here pray for me, um, uh, Father, to lift me up. I covet those prayers. And let us not be afraid, Lord, to share our weaknesses with others. Um, Father, your word says that um, as the body comes together, it is strengthened by confessing our sins one to another. Um, Lord, because it removes the opportunity of the devil to use it as a wedge between us. Um, Lord, help me to always remember, uh, Father, as there was one sacrifice, there is that one repentance, and help us to walk in that repentance of our sin uh, that we truly have turned away from the world. And I just thank you so much for each and every person here. I pray that they would be filled with your Holy Spirit so that they would be bold in the faith. Move upon them, Lord. Use them as the body of Christ and do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, do you have that video ready? In the videos folder in ProPresenter, open up the media tray. Yeah, and then videos is the first. Looks like a guy with a beard. That's it. Need some sound. Hang on, start it over. Click on it again. music don't push yeah go over to the video click the video eat only kosher foods you've got to become a vegetarian you face jerusalem you've got to face india when you pray you pray only in hebrew and you grow a nice big beer and if you do all of those outward cultural things you'll discover the god of the universe And I'm thinking this is crazy that someone thinks that they can force their culture on God and that God's going to be impressed by what you wear, what direction you face when you pray, what you eat, and all these sorts of things. It seemed to me that if there was a God out there who could be known, 
He should be able to be recognized no matter where I face, no matter how I'm dressed, because he's God. Growing up, we always understood that we had our Bible and the Gentiles had their Bible, the New Testament, and that they were two completely separate books. Because the only people I knew who were believers in Jesus were all people in our public school who were Italian Catholic, I imagined that Jesus was Italian. <laughs> and so the understanding that he's actually Jewish was, was a shock. And then to hear that the New Testament was written by Jews, I, I couldn't believe it. My expectation was that the New Testament was like my grandparents had told me. It was a, a book on how to persecute the Jews and something you should stay away from. Of course, when you're told you should stay away from something, <laughs> curiosity gets the best of you and you've got to see it. When I opened the New Testament, I was expecting to find a handbook on how to persecute the Jews. My grandparents had warned me that it was written by people who killed the Jews. That's what I was expecting to see, and yet when I'm opening it, I'm reading a story written by Jews about Jewish people. The New Testament was a fascinating book. And so as I opened this book in the library, I kind of looked around, made sure that none of my friends had seen me taking a Christian Bible off the shelf. And I open it, here's the first sentence. It says, this is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So three people are mentioned and they're all Jewish. I was very shocked. And as I continue to read, I'm reading the story of a Jewish man who was born in a Jewish village, in a Jewish country, and one day walks into a synagogue and announces that he is the Messiah. The more I read the words of Jesus, the more I became attracted to him. It was as beautiful as anything I had ever read in any other part of the Bible. As I came to faith that Yeshua, that Jesus was the Messiah, it was clear that that was the most Jewish thing I could do. This is not the person who's a renegade to our people. This is the one who was promised in our Bible. It's the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. It is astonishing. If you would just read that chapter, just without the Bible being around it, you would say, oh, this is some Christian Bible. This is Jesus. <laughs> when you realize, though, that it's in the middle of our Bible, our Jewish Bible, when I first came to faith, I dared not tell my father um, because this is a time period in the, the 1970s when there were lots of gurus and cults and he was very concerned about me getting involved in some crazy sect and going off someplace. So I waited for months and uh, when I finally told him, he was very skeptical. On his own then, he started to read about Jesus as well. About a year and a half later, I told him that the fellow who wrote one of the books that he had read, that this fellow was giving a lecture in the city of New York. And he agreed to come out to hear that person. And uh, one of the most amazing moments of my life was, the speaker said, would everyone here who is a Jewish believer in Jesus, would you raise your hand? And I raised my hand. My father also raised his hand. And I said, I looked over and I said, Pop, he didn't say, would all the Jews raise their hand? He said, would all the Jewish believers in Jesus raise their hand? And my father looked over and he said, yes, I, I heard what he said. The decision to come to faith in Jesus as the Messiah was not something that was a momentary lark. It wasn't something that was a passing fad. And I could see changes in myself that I knew were not from within myself. I had kind of tapped in to a truth for our Jewish people that was very powerful. Awesome. And you see, this is what the priests were experiencing. This is what you and I can experience. And then in being able to share that testimony with others, that was five minutes. What a great testimony. You know, and every time I see it, just, uh, you know, it reminds me of when my father, two weeks before he died of non-small cell lung cancer, gave his life to Jesus Christ. You know, and that's like one of the most beautiful things in the world is to know your children have come to know him. Uh, it's just, you know, 
Wow. And it's good vice versa, too. So uh, can we do the benediction? You guys want to stand with me? And remember, we do have New Haven today at 1.30. Um, and if you'd like to go and you don't know where it is, approach me or Liz or Rather, and we can tell you where it's at. All right. Let's do this. The Lord bless thee. And keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee. And be gracious unto thee. And be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance. Upon thee and give thee peace. Amen. Praise the Lord. Have a blessed day in the Lord. Talk to somebody before you go. Go have lunch with someone you don't know. Whatever you're going to do, be blessed.